Welcome to episode three of The Real MC. Today I'm sitting down with the one and only Elliot Hulse. For those of you who know who he is, you already know the fire that's coming. For those who don't, prepare to be triggered and perhaps even enlightened. We discussed how the etymology of the word matrix gives us a clue to its real meaning. This was a, a mind blower for me personally. We also talked about how even if you are somebody who doesn't believe in good versus evil, God and the devil, how these ancient ideas of comparing chaos and order can still benefit you in your day-to-day -day life. We also touched on how now is the time for Elliot's all-out war on Vice News and all things Vice, as well as how you can pick up your torch and carry on this mission as well. Ultimately, we live in a matrix that denigrates tradition, culture, virtue, men, and women. And Elliot shares with us his recipes for how to fight your war against the vices within and the vices outside. It was a deep dive that I know you'll grab some nuggets from, and I encourage you to listen to the entire conversation all the way to the end, even if what Elliot says triggers you. I promise there's some nuggets in there that you can pull out and apply in your life, even if you don't agree with everything that Elliot says. And for those of you watching on YouTube, first of all, thank you for being here. If you enjoy this video, please like and comment and let me know what I can do better to improve the quality of this show. And if you really like it, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, and don't miss any episodes of The Real MC two times a month. And for those of you who are listening on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify, do me a favor, leave a rating, leave a review. Even if it's one star and you suck, MC, it will help me improve the show. And if you think these are messages that should reach more people, well, that's the only way that it's going to happen because the algorithms sure are not going to love this show. And of course, before I go any further, a brief thank you to our sponsor for today's show, Ancestral Fuel and Ancient Strength. You'll hear more about Ancestral Fuel later on in the show, but just know this, this is the best protein powder on earth, and you can go to fuelyourevolution.com if you'd like to learn more. So if you're ready to disconnect from the matrix and learn how you can turn chaos into order in your life, stay tuned for this incredible conversation with Elliot Hulse on episode three of The Real MC. Roll that intro. Welcome to The Real MC with your host, Mark Kuda. Are you the real MC of your life? The master of ceremonies, the creator, builder, architect, and driver? Or are you a slave to the matrix? What mysteries from our past and visions of our future can we lean on to unlock paradise? Let's find out and break out together with the ideas, strategies, and tactics to help you live the life you were designed for. A life of purpose, prosperity, and passion. Tell me what it takes to be the real MC. Welcome, everybody, to episode three of The Real MC. For the men in our audience, today is going to be an episode that is quite a treat, but if you are a lady friend, please don't turn the dial just yet because what this man that I have with me today has to say impacts both men and women in this crazy world trying to be the real MC. A little bit of background on my guest who, of course, is the illustrious one and only Elliot Hulse. He is considered by, I would say, pretty much everybody to be an OG in the online fitness and strength training community. He actually started uploading his first strength training videos to his Strength Camp YouTube channel over 15 years ago, if you can believe that. And I would actually encourage you to go back and watch his oldest videos as I did in preparing for this interview. I think it's really amazing to see not just the passion that he has sustained through this entire time, but also how much he has grown in that period, which I think is a big part of being a real MC. So I'd encourage you to do your research and look into Elliot and his channel a little bit more. But even though he has built what I would say is a very prosperous life and a prosperous business out of Strength Camp, it wasn't always that way. And that's something that we'll hopefully touch on today. Elliot has traversed 
many periods of deep depression, financial struggle, philosophical and religious awakening, and all of that while dealing with the ever-present challenges of being a young father and husband in this uh, degenerate age, as I think he so eloquently puts it. Um, but that's not all because Elliot actually has a second channel, self-titled as Elliot Hulse, that also has nearly a million subscribers, where he takes on his other persona, that of a healer, a mentor, and a guide to men that are seeking to become the strongest versions of themselves, not just physically, but also mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And if that is not enough, Elliot most recently launched an all-out counter war on Vice News and all things vice in this prevailing culture that denigrates masculinity, family, God, and tradition. In my opinion, Elliot is a textbook example of a real MC, somebody who is truly unplugged from the matrix and living a life worth living. I'm very, very grateful that we have him with us today for the next hour or so, and I'm excited for him to share with us his thoughts on escaping the matrix, purpose, prosperity, and passion. So, Elliot, thank you, brother, for making the time to be with me today. It's my pleasure, MC. Thanks for having me, bro. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, take it, kick this off. I know I said before we started recording that I didn't want to rehash all the same questions that you've been asked before. Mm -hmm. So, I want to dive into what I think this show is really about, like the root of what this show is. And for those who have listened to the episodes already, this show is about escaping the matrix, right? Uh, the problems with modern culture and the way that, that the culture is built to keep us consuming, docile, and just disconnected from who we really should be. Mm -hmm. So before we get started, I would love for you to define for me, in your opinion, what is the matrix? Not the movie, but the real life matrix. Oh, so I have a very poetic way of pointing out the difference between the matter and the pattern of the world that we live in, right? So the word matrix, now, mind you, this is bro, Elliot Hulse, yo, Elliot Science. I don't know if this is fact or not, <laughs> but I tend to like to look at the root words of things. I like to look at the etiology or the etymology, the mm -hmm. etymology of words. I know I'm not even saying that right. I like words. Can't even pronounce the word that talks about <laughs> words. But <laughs> I like to look at the root of words. And so that word M matrix, M-A-T, kind of like material, right? Because it has the same M-A-T. Same as matriarch, right? Like mother. And interesting point. Uh, yeah, there's, and so there's this sort of thread that runs through the, the, the sensuality, the, the, the tangibility, the, the feeling aspect of the matrix. You, you feel the matrix. It's material, right? The mother is the s is where feeling comes from in the family. The mother's the heart of the family. Most of our first feelings surround the mother, right? And so there's something that that ties that all together: mommy, matrix, material, matter, mother, matter, matter and mother. Very similar in words too. And then we look at the the polar opposite of it, right? Like the other side of the coin, the yang to the yin, right? which is father, father. The word father comes from pater, right? Where we get paternity, where we use the word pattern, pattern. The, the paternity, the father is the pattern. Pattern also means archetype. An archetype is a pattern, a consistency, uh, an essence of something, spirit. Pattern is spirit. And so I like to say that we as human beings are the pattern in the matter. We are a pattern like God, spirit, in matter, flesh, God, the father, mother, earth, if you will. And so when you ask me what the matrix is, first, I, we take that step back and we look at the contrast between pattern and matter, spirit and material, spirit and flesh, and all that's associated with both of them, right? I think this conversation is uniquely important to men. Because as a man, we are born up out of the matter, just like a woman is born up out of the matter. We all come from the matter. We all come from our mother, right? The difference between a young man and a young lady growing up is that 
although we both separate from our mother in a way, right? We, we don't totally separate from matter. We separate from mother. We have an ego um, individuation, right? And you say, you know, like around the time the baby starts saying no, recognizes, oh, okay, I no longer believe that I am my mother, right? There's a, they say that there's a, there's a time when the baby thinks that it's its mother. It's, it's one thing, right? We're still like in that sort of everything's one phase but at a certain point baby starts to recognize oh no no i'm i'm this and mommy's that right so that's the first ego split that happens and in a way it's a it's a rites of passage it's a it's an initiation let me put it that way it's an initiation into your new ego you have an ego now you're an individuated ego from your mother from the matter from the matrix if you will but for a boy there's a second break there's the break that happens usually around age four. Freud called it the Oedipal complex, where he breaks with the world. He breaks from his ego identification with his mother as other gender. And so in order for that to happen appropriately or resourcefully, there has to be a leap into pattern. There has to be a leap towards the father. That's usually what happens. You start to recognize, oh, I am not of my mother's gender, but I can associate with my father. That's the first wound that we experience as men if there isn't a father there or a father that recognizes the significance of that leap for a boy. Now, as we, as we age and our body changes, we get to about uh, adolescence and another initiation has to happen speci specifically for boys because un unlike girls, our bodies are, our bodies are different. Right, they have a different initiation. Nature gives them their initiation. Their initiation is called a period. End of sentence. Boom. All right, <laughs> that's it. It's over. Yeah, you're no longer a child. Doesn't happen for a boy. Right. Doesn't happen for a boy. What happens for a boy traditionally, cross culturally, anthropologists have found that there's always a rites of passage initiation process. Right. And check this out: the rites of passage initiation process, according to anthropologists like Marcia Eliade cross-culturally is the same and it has a singular pattern now it might have different con content but the context is the same it's a movement away from the world of the mother and an atonement with the world of the father so let me give you an example so when you see watch that movie the lion king i watched it the first one when it was a cartoon when i was a kid Damn. there is a break in the boy's ego when his father dies and he's he's he, he leaves the land. He's got to right. go off. He leaves his mom. He leaves the girl behind that he grew up with that he liked. He left the world of the mother. He left the matrix, if you will. All things associated with pleasure. Right. All Coddling. things associated with being home. All things associated with the heart, sensuality, ease, uh, pleasure, comfort, things of this nature. All these things are associated with the world of the mother, the world of the matrix. And he goes off into the wilderness. And, and, and for a time, he's in the wilderness. And that's significant, too. There's a time that we might find ourselves in a tunnel of sorts in the wilderness. But ultimately, for him to have come full circle, he's found by the elder. He's found by the old monkey, Rafiki. He takes him up to the mountain. And so the monkey says to him, you don't know who you are. You forgot who you are. You don't know who you are. And he's like, yeah, I have no clue because my dad died. <laughs> right. No clue. He, all he knows is what he left, which was the matrix. I know I left the matrix and I'm out here in the wilderness. That's all I know. Right. And so the monkey takes him up to the mountain and the first thing he does is what? Points to the sky. What's up there? Pattern, father. I mean, we look up in the sky, what do we see? Patterns. We see nothing but patterns, just patterns. But yeah, he shows him every and night. And there's the metaphor of the pattern of the father. So you see his father, the pattern of his father emerges out of the stars. This is significant. It says to him, don't forget who you are, son. And don't forget all of the fathers, all of the patriarchs, all of the patterns, the paternal men that came before you from the past. And so I know that's a long winded, poetic, wild, weird way of this, answering a question about the matrix. I could have said it's just a fake place, but I kind of wrapped my mind around that one day and I thought it sounded pretty good. So I wanted to share it with you, dude. Make of it what you will. <laughs> I actually really like that because when I look at the world today, and one of the reasons why I started this show was obviously my own journey that 
kind of mirrors that journey that Simba went through, right? That hero's journey out into the wilderness, that full circle. Like I can resonate that with that. I know that you can as well. And what I have found is that the world has sort of deleted that, like that de deleted that period of disconnection. First, it was like the disconnection from the, the, you know, the initiation, that rites of passage that happens when a boy becomes a man that was like deleted, called toxic, unnecessary, silly, whatever. And then it like went even earlier on and, and now they're deleting the connection to the father all, all, all together. And, and, you know, you see movies and TV shows over the last few decades, men and fathers went from being the head of the household, the badass, the one that keeps it all together to the butt of every joke. You know, you think about like everybody loves Raymond and, and, and the way that they portray a father in that show. And you see that in culture. And, and now we're going even further and we're seeing that now they're telling children that there is no separation between gender, that, that it's just a social construct that shouldn't or doesn't need to exist. And, and so it's like, a continuing muddying and deletion of that separation that you're talking about from the dream world, <laughs> from the, the pleasure seeking world. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you agree with me on this, but personally, I think that it's all by design. I think that this is a, a purposeful effort to subvert Western culture, Christian or Judeo-Christian values, let's say, and ultimately destroy the West or even at a deeper level, in some sense, destroy humanity. And a lot of people, uh, you know, they said that's a conspiracy theory and that there's no proof of that and that I'm silly for even thinking so. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about what you think has caused this deletion of that initiation into the pattern and the let's say the continuation of living in the matrix and that pleasure seeking world like what do you think is the is the root cause of that and why we're seeing that in the world well the root goes back to the garden and that that's the rebellion of eve against her husband and her husband against his father and so if i if i could <laughs> nail it with one word i'd say it's ancient feminism <laughs> from the get go it was the woman being tempted by satan in the garden but the man allowed the subversion to happen he wasn't protecting her and so i don't know if she was a strong independent woman and she said i don't need no protecting from you adam i'm gonna do what i want i'm gonna talk to any snake i want and he said okay or he was being like most men today which is he's either being lazy or distracted effeminate didn't want to didn't want to hurt his wife's feelings I didn't want to tell her. I didn't want to tell her no. I just wanted her to be happy. Not only that, but then he followed her lead. That's what men do today. The fruit for men following women today is free sex, right? Because ever since you got the sterilization through the pill and, you know, blowing loads in plastic bags, guys, you know, they will follow women to the ends of the earth because they get to blow their load. Yeah. So, uh, in a nutshell, right? That's like taking the high view, right? Like, I could say Satan, right? So it's Satan. But look, if we follow history, we see patterns. It's like, okay, well, if that was the beginning and it happened there, it literally is exactly happening now, just in a different way. It isn't just a man and a woman and, and a serpent. It's entire nations, entire cultures, and the entire world under the influence of this, uh, this subversion, this trick, this. Uh, lie that we are so willing to to believe so if we bring it to the say the 20th century what we're watching in the 20th century is the unfolding of the bolshevism that started in russia right it didn't begin none of, this didn't begin then it began way before then i mean we could talk about different the different phases that we got that got us here but the right. one that i think is the is, has, is most prominent in its unfolding in Western civilization and America today began with the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. And as Our Lady said, if Russia wasn't converted, then all the errors of Russia would move West and, uh, and pervert the world. And so what are the errors of Russia? Well, communism, atheism, feminism. And if you just study the work of say, Antonio Gramsci, Mark Lukacs, uh, Karl Marx uh, uh, and, and Engels, you see right there in their words, their intention to do just what we have right now. For example, 
uh, Antonio Gramsci says, in order for us to, you know, the, the Marxists, the Bolsheviks, in order for us to win over the West, we can't do it with bombs and bullets. They're too strong, too much ec ec economic power. He said that it would require a long march to the institutions. Right. A long march to the institutions means get into the government, get into the media, get into the schools, get right. into get into the newspaper, the, everything, get into the corporation, get and anywhere you can. Let's put one of our men there. That was one thing he said. He also said that you have to de-Christianize the West. He says, right. because if the West holds true to its OG standards, to its traditional standards, then you can't subvert the people. You have to watch. You need a clean slate. You got to sterilize them of all semblance of tradition. And Western tradition, Western civilization is built on Christendom. It's Christendom. It's, it's Catholicism. The, the Catholic Church is the West. That's what gave us, that's what brought us, you know, it, to where we are right now. And so they knew we have to destroy the church. And in destroying the church, you do, number, you do a number of things. You destroy the image of the father, God the father, because you need atheism, because communism is a religion of the state. So you got to worship the state. And so you have, to have, you have to destroy the father. But you also, especially according to Engels, he pioneered this, you have to destroy the father in the home. So the entire thing is a matter of erasing the pattern, so God the father, and the father in the home from the culture so that you can make women and children dependent on the state. And we right. know that a woman who's not being protected by her husband or a good alpha male leader as a man, a father, uh, will fall subject to all kinds of diabolical temptation. Oh, you can be just like a man and, and, and have sterile sex as much as you want. You can just kill your baby. It's, it's just a clump of cells. Like, well, like when Satan said to, at, to Eve in the garden, surely you won't die. Surely you won't die if you eat that fruit. That's exactly what we hear. Surely there's no, there's no harm in killing your baby. They don't say it that way. In aborting that clump of cells. Yeah. Surely there's no problem in divorcing your husband because you fell out of love. Children from families where they're, the families together are no better off than families where their divorce surely you can go ride the cock carousel for 15 years and expect to have no re re repercussions and it's going to be okay and then you're going to have a happy healthy marriage for the rest of your life sure you could have a career go make lots of money in your young years you should become strong and independent oh don't worry your eggs can be frozen for later all these things are temptations and they sound good they're like wow well yeah and all you had to do was unleash the chastity. And men were like, go, girl, as long yeah. as we're having lots of sex with you and no responsibility, y'all can do whatever you want. Which, well, is, which, of are. course, is a which is, of course, a feminization of men, because that's them not taking responsibility for what they're designed to do, which is provide, preside, protect and be the man and be the head of something greater than themselves to build a family, to carry on tradition to carry on their seed to do any of those things. So I, I actually agree with everything that you said from a personal on a personal level. But I know that a lot of my listeners and even friends that I have and people that I debate this topic with all the time, they scoff at the idea of, you know, good versus evil or some sort of dark reality behind the world that we see today. And they just see it as they, they label it as progressivism, right? Oh, everything's just progressing. You know, we're, we're, we're becoming more tolerant, except for people who disagree with us, but that's besides the point, right? And, and they just have this like really soft viewpoint of everything. And, and they refuse to believe that there could be something at play that is deep, that is dark, that is more than just money or, you know, and greed and, and power. And I know that you can't change people's minds or their hearts. They have to do that themselves. But I'm curious as somebody who has these conversations often with people, I'm sure that you do as well. What do you say to people who, you know, have their head in the sand and they don't see that what is happening is a bad thing? Like, how do you begin to convince someone, let's say somebody who's listening and is thinking that exact thing, what would you say to them about how they could begin going down this path of discovering for themselves the truth in what you're saying? Well, I usually just propose this. What do you 
appreciate more in your life? When is your life better? Is your life better when there's order or when there's chaos? When there's order in your life, do you feel better? Do you feel more in control? Do you feel like things are a bit smoother? Or are you thriving in chaos when there's no schedule, there's no routine, there's no pattern, there's whatever? Which one do you prefer? Which one would be indicative of a healthy life? Which one would be conducive to mental health? Which one? And so nobody can, nobody can argue. There's no argument. If you, if you like chaos, well, then we have a totally different story. <laughs> right, right. But well, you got to start from a totally part, different place. <laughs> right. We, we thrive in order. We yes. thrive in order, right? The diff- that's the difference between a wild jungle and a manicured garden. Which one's going to bear better fruit? Right. The one that's cared for, the one that has rows and boundaries. And, you know, I know people make food for us and stuff. Maybe that's not a good example. But the one that's tended to is going to be right. better. It's, so it's intentional. It's guided. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you appreciate order, let me ask you then this, because here this this becomes the linchpin between two different directions you, you you're choosing to go down. And, and I think it hinges on this because this is the peak of the diabolical disorientation that we're under. Is it more orderly or less orderly? Let's contrast. There's a man and a woman. There's men and women. Okay, let's see where we decide to put that. There's 67 different genders. And you can choose whichever one you want. You can change anytime you'd like. And everybody has to play along. Which one sounds more orderly? Okay. So there's no no moral judgment. No moral judgments. Just which one sounds like order and which one sounds like chaos. You can't can't argue. Right. If you were designing a puzzle and you wanted to be as simple as possible to put together, you'd make it with two pieces, not 67. (laughs) <laughs> right. And we can go right down the line with every single thing that's, uh, you know, a, a charged topic. Right. Yeah. Is, and, and so when people say or or they reject or they cringe at the idea of good and evil, I don't go good and evil. I don't go good and evil. Good and evil are they're, they're, they're ways of describing what? Order. Good. Chaos. Yeah. <laughs> feels good. Order feels good. And chaos. That don't feel so good. Now, does that mean that we can eliminate chaos completely? No, that's just the nature of things. But do we do we have pride? I love it. Are we proud to be disordered? Not only that, but we're going to march down your streets and proclaim our disorder as some sort of righteous movement. And if you don't love my disorder, then there's something wrong with you. You're holding us back. It doesn't make any sense. You don't need a moral theological degree to realize, oh, that doesn't sound like it makes much sense. It don't. People that live lives of disorder need our help. They don't need our enabling. They don't need us to, to, to basically use them. They're being used because Marx understood that you need class division. He understood that in order for communism to work, you need class divisions. You have to separate people. Part of the reason why the, the Marxism didn't work, the Bolsheviks didn't, they couldn't proceed West was because the middle class was rising. There was a burgeoning middle class in the U.S. in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. It was growing. And so people started to have this sense of prosperity, and they weren't, they weren't, they didn't take on that natural or that um, diabolical tendency to want to denigrate those that are separate from them. They were like, oh, well, that guy's wealthy, but I live in America, and I can do it too. Look at the middle classes. Give me a chance. So they were, the people, they didn't want to do it economically. So Gramsci understood I think I think it was Gramsci, Gramsci or Lucas. I think it might it might have been him. There's so many different these these guys, or um, forget his name. 
but uh, 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 oh man, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Herbert something. He he knew he was like we can't do it economically. They did it. They tried to do it economically. They did it fairly well in Russia because Russia was in a place that where that was it made sense because there was such a a split a wide gap a widening gap between the rich so and the it's poor. Just to pause you real quick, just for some context. So what you're saying is they they couldn't bring down Western culture, Western civilization, and subvert that that civilization through an economic. economic split because the middle class was growing too fast. So they had to go with something that wasn't just, oh, you're poor, so you need us. Exactly. Got it. So, okay, continue. So they came up with what was called cultural Marxism. Right. Cultural Marxism. It's So that was an economic Marxism that you just described. You're right. They couldn't do it because why? Capitalism works. Nobody was upset. They were all happy. Hey, we were making money. So they had to do it through cultural means. And, that was, and because economics is so black and white it's like you have money or you don't have money and there are numbers it's very it's very uh quantifiable <laughs> culture you can make up all kinds of stuff i identify as a rabbit that's cultural marxism and you must obey my demand that you call me a rabbit when i'm around yes sir mr rabbit sir right so you can you it's so much more pliable so he right. uh it was uh, Her Herbert something. He knew that we would have to do it through feminism. He said, you, he said the way we're going to get, we're going to do this in America is through feminists, blacks, and homosexuals. He says, we got to stir up discontent. Mind you, in the 1930s, women didn't even, I, I, I'm not going to go into the, the history of all this, but there's, uh, there was a solid amount of women that had no interest in becoming men. Believe it or not, prior to the 1960s, <laughs> they had no interest. They were home. You know, they, they call them step work wives or whatever these days. Right. But they were mm -hmm. traditional wives. They were at home and they were happy. Their right. husbands made enough money and it was great. They they didn't they didn't want to vote because voting came from a family. It wasn't this individualistic thing. The family was a unit. So the husband being the head of the family voted for the family. But, you know, the, the Marxists understood that if you split the woman, feminism, you split the woman, you you can delete the man's vote. You cancel his vote. And so they get more economic power. Right. Because Blacks naturally, the women are going to vote differently than men because they are, let's call it, living in the matrix in that natural maternal state. And so that's going to right then and there split the culture in half. Yeah. In many different ways. I mean, things like, you know, of course, abortion, <laughs> like that's one of them. If men don't vote to kill babies. Unless, you know, they're addicted to blowing their load in girls and, and, and making babies. They get some fetish, fetish out of it. <laughs> That's how they get it. So same thing, same thing with blacks. I'm a, I'm a half black man, so you can't call me racist. Or I guess you could. Yeah, they call black guys racist all the time uh, against blacks. Uh, in the 1950s, the black family well, had minuscule divorce. They didn't divorce. They were very religious, super conservative. Black families in America in the 1950s were solid, stronger than the whites. They didn't, there was no, there was no need for the so-called civil rights march. A lot of that, a lot of that, a lot of that was fabricated, believe it or not. Just like what? BLM and the whole, and everything that we deal with today. It was fabricated. Just because our history books tell us, oh, this is some uh, righteous movement don't mean we've got to believe it. Why were blacks doing better before the, the so-called civil rights movement, because there was less government intervention, right? There was less communism, less Marxism. And then the same thing, you know, with, you know, we can go down the whole homosexual rabbit, but look where it's gotten us, transgenderism, where they've confused the hell out of little kids. Yeah. Yeah, to the point of uh, massacring themselves, uh, both with surgeries and puberty blockers. And now you've probably seen recently that warnings that are coming out of the FDA about the puberty blocker medications that the pharmaceutical companies and the media and the news are pushing and the institutions and, and all of that. And, and, you know, I see it so clearly. I love the way that you explained it because I think it will help people to see it as well. That contrast between chaos and order, like we're not going towards order um, and order, order feels better than chaos. And if we bring that all the way down to the ground level of our life, that's, that's always true. Now, 
Before we go any further and talk about what you can do to escape the matrix, I want to talk about just one aspect of matrix escaping, and that is Ancestral Fuel by Ancient Strength, which is the sponsor of today's show. Now, as some of you may be aware, I am the founder and creator of Ancient Strength and our first product, Ancestral Fuel, which is an ultra-premium animal-based protein powder designed to help you improve your digestion while you build more muscle. Four years ago, when I was at the brink in my health journey, I discovered ancestral nutrition and I discovered bone broth. And I went on this strict diet for almost six months of almost entirely bone broth, stewed meats, and eggs. And this contrarian animal-based diet not only healed my gut, but it gave me back my vigor for life. And when I healed, I decided to start drinking protein powder. But alas, no matter what I did, I could not find a protein powder that ticked all the boxes. Made in the USA, designed by a, con a company that had the values and the morals that I believed in. Moving to the product that was made of ultra premium, the highest quality ingredients possible that had no emulsifiers, additives, artificial sweeteners, or any other junk. And also that tasted good and mixed well. And that's why I spent the last two and a half years developing Ancestral Fuel. It's made with only six simple ingredients, grass-fed, pasture-raised beef protein, bone broth protein, egg whites, cocoa powder, Himalayan sea salt, and monk fruit. It's absolutely incredible stuff. If you want to support my work, that is currently the only way that you can do so. So if you drink protein powder, I encourage you, head to Fuel Your evolution.com. The link will also be in the show notes or check us out on Instagram at ancient strength and consider giving ancestral fuel a try. Now back to the show. And so on this same line, and, and then I want to move on to some other topics, but I, I do want to ask one more question on this kind of idea of, of Marxism, cultural Marxism, communism, subverting Western culture. Um, if you delete this whole God and Satan battle, let's say the spiritual aspect of the warfare. And the only reason why I keep going down this, this route is because I want people who aren't yet there to still be able to see the truth in what we're talking about, because I think seeing that truth leads you towards realizing what's really, really going on. So in your opinion, why would, and I know this seems like a silly question, but why would they want to bring communism, globalism, centralized power, why would that be a benefit to the people in power? Like, how can people see that clearly in what's being done today? Well, you can see it clearly in what happened with 2020 with the, with the global econ economic shutdown. What they essentially did was they told everybody that wasn't a global totalitarian communistic uh, corporation that you're non-essential and you need to shut down. But yet Walmart, Amazon and all these big box mega corporations worldwide were enriched a thousand fold. The type of communism, the to it's, it's totalitarianism as well. It's 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 not the communism of Karl Marx. He would be proud beyond doubt if he saw what we were doing right now, because it is a, it's a mutated monster that includes capitalism. It's it, it is it capitalism is deeply ingrained in this global totalitarian takeover that I'm using the word communism. That's because there's no other word. Right. Right. Because it's the essence from which it comes. But all these corporations, these are non-government organizations and they are ruling our lives. Apple runs our lives. Google runs our lives. Amazon runs our lives. Uh, um, Walmart runs our lives. So, you know, you got these like I remember when leftists and liberals were anti-corporation. But something somewhere along the line, they became so bought into the party line that they want totalitarianism and they're happy, it seems, or they don't know, that we are losing big time, not to, not to a resourceful ideal, but to like pinky in the brain. A bunch of real evil masterminds who are literally like Klaus Schwab, like yeah. we are taking over the <laughs> entire world <laughs> and humans are no longer humans. 
You're part android with pieces in your brain and we can track everything they do. We're like cattle. And the, and the way they, they rule us is through their economic system, their economic system. And we saw that with, you know, with COVID. So if, if, if that sounds good to you, well, then we don't have a conversation. But if that concerns you, then the things I'm talking about are the roots that got us to where we are in terms of what we saw in 2020. I love that. And I think that it's very logical and pragmatic what you're saying, and it requires no leap of faith to see. And I, I genuinely think that listeners are going to resonate with what you just said, and I hope it's going to open a couple of eyes. So for, for, for people who are starting to see that, what do you recommend that they do? Like, how do they begin the journey, in your opinion, of unplugging the matrix from the matrix? Let's say they're completely lost. They're just totally confused. They look up and they go, wow, everything is a complete mess. Where would Uncle E tell them to start? Look, if you're in a boat, let's say you're in a boat, you left the shore. And you go out into the waters and a storm comes and starts rocking that boat and turning you around. Where do you want to go with that boat? Back to the shore. Let's get back to shore as quickly as possible where there's stable ground. Where were we before Bolshevism? Where were we before the global totalitarian takeover? If you go back a thousand years, let's say, because, I mean, the breakdown has been progressive. Trust me, it's not that it just happened. It's been progressive. But you don't even have to go back a thousand years. You go back a hundred years. Go back a hundred years and you'll see a totally different picture. A thousand years, at least we're about halfway back to the shore. You're, you're going to want to do your best to get back to where you came from. I'm a retrograde. I don't believe in progress. I'm sorry. I don't believe there's any such thing as progress. This idea that we're perpetually moving forward is a lie. All you got to do is look at history. We're never moving forward. We might have different technology. We might have different ideas, but human nature just keeps doing this. You don't have to be a Christian that reads the Bible, but that's a good idea. When you read the Bible, you start to see, wow, the whole Bible just seems to be like a story of humans falling out of grace being received into grace, falling out of grace, being received into grace. There's like chaos and then there's order and then there's chaos and there's order. But even the old religion of Hinduism, they describe these epochs and, 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 and cycles. They just tell you, look, there are cycles of order and chaos and it just keeps doing this. That's why they believe in reincarnation. It just keeps doing this. So progress is a lie. Progress is a lie. It doesn't exist. You're, we're just doing this. We're literally just spinning. We're not going anywhere. But if we're doing this, then if we find ourselves here, the only other place to go is back here. And when we're here, we're ultimately going to get here again. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. It just does this. So if we're at hard times create strong men, because I do believe that the next generation is going to be a much tougher generation than millennials because they're going to be they're going to suffer. But let's say we're going into that. A part of what that looks like is a return to tradition. It always does. It always does. Just read the Bible and you'll see, oh, OK, they started worshiping false idols. Our biggest false idol today is our ego. We worship ourselves all day walking around with this mirror, staring at ourselves like narcissists, just falling right into our own image. We wor we're self-worshippers. We're pagan, not in that we worship statues of deities, but we worship our technology. We worship ourselves. We're self-worshippers. So just like in the Bible, Bible when, you know, when, when Israel falls, you know, falls for the false gods, and at some point, God's like, okay, all right, guys, enough, enough. And there's a chastisement. There's always a chastisement. There's either the flood in, the, in Genesis, or there's wars and famine. And where are we right now? We're, we're, heading, we're heading down that road. So we can expect chastisement. There's, there's no question about it. Just like any kid who gets out of line, he can expect that his parents are going to punish him. There's a punishment. It's, you don't even have to look at it as a punishment. 
you look at it as like the equal outcome of the you you know you put in and you get out. You just, yeah. It's just natural. It just Cause makes sense. Effect. Right. If you live, if you have chaotic thoughts and you harbor chaotic values, your life is going to fall into chaos. And that, so that's that's where we are. But then the next step, it's always a return to tradition. It's not making up something new. It's not making up something new. It's a return to Catholicism, the church, to Christendom, as crazy as that sounds. You might not like it, but your kids are going to love it. They're going to love the order. They're going to love the tradition. They're going to love the return to angelic music rather than this crap that they listen to. They're going to return to smelling incense in the morning and chanting prayers in the evening. They're going to love it. They're going to return to mommy and daddy and plenty of children, homesteading and homeschooling. They're going to they love it. And I see Gen X, which is the generation that's going to, is, I think it's turning, not Gen X, Gen Z, sorry. Last generation, the pivot generation. There's no reason. What's after, what's after Z? <laughs> Go back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That generation is loving tradition. There's a huge traditional Latin movement in the church. And for the most part, it's young people, young men, young alpha male men. No longer these, you know, homo globo uh, uh, priests that, that, I don't know if you know, but were that infiltrated the church in the 1950s. The, the School of Darkness is a book written uh, about Bella Dodd, who, who was who, who was a you know feminist and she's a Marxist and so on. Uh, she admitted after her reversion back to the faith from uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen that they purposefully installed over a thousand homosexuals into the seminaries. Why? To destroy the church. They knew that if you got a bunch of homos in there, there would be a lot of scandal. And the homos started, they would promote more homos. So what do we have right now? We have the church infiltrated from the inside. You don't hate Jesus because of Judas, but you got Judas in the church right now. But all that is on its way out because I'm watching the Gen Zers pick up their banner and return to tradition. And they're the ones that are going to take, you know, take the place of the old dying homos. It's, so funny, that it's so funny that you say that because... You know, I, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but I grew up a Jehovah's Witness and I left when I was 22 years old. My wife and I bought an RV. We went traveling for a year. I smoked a bunch of weed and went totally in the opposite direction. And I became extremely nihilistic. I was an atheist. I was very existential. Like I lived that deep, dark valley that you're talking about. Like I went there. I grew my hair out. I grew a really long beard. Like I did the whole fucking thing. Right. And it took me seven years and actually literally very, like very, very recently after the last two years of searching and seeking and reading and researching and prayer, I came back to Christ. I mean, I literally became a follower, like a real follower of Christ, literally like less than 45 days ago. Like this is super new in my life. <laughs> and so I, I can see it from my own perspective, right? And I'm 30 years old. And so I'm like a little bit older than the Gen Zers, but like I'm right in that mix where I'm I'm understanding how important it is to return to tradition. And actually, I would love if on an, another time we could have a much deeper conversation about Catholicism, a return to the Father, God, religion, and all of those topics, because I have a quadrillion questions. I would love to pick your brain on that. But since, uh, since we don't have that much more time, I want to turn to a topic that I think is very interrelated to what we've been discussing, and that is your recent all-out war on vice. Obviously that connects because vice as a, as an idea and as an organization stands for destroying tradition, this progressivism idea and, and moving away from, from order and into complete chaos. So pretend that those who are listening have no idea what I'm talking about or what this whole vice situation is. Talk to me about that. Give me the update and, and tell me what that whole story is and, and why it connects to the conversation that we've been having. Well, about a week, maybe two weeks ago, a bunch of my fans sent me some emails. Hey, Elliot, they're attacking you on uh, on social media. And they were sending, they, and one of them sent me a screenshot of a, I don't know if it was TikTok or Snapchat, some vertical video uh, with my face <laughs> and the headline reading, accused of inciting mass shootings of women. Oh my God, that's, 
that's i laughed i was like well that's silly <laughs> like that's kind of that's really silly i mean i don't even want to go down the rabbit hole how silly that is but i have three daughters and a wife married my high school girlfriend i love women i'm not gonna incite anything against women my whole crusade is to make women great again just like men but anyway so i normally leave things like that alone because everybody knows it's silly and it's it's like whatever but it dawned on me how divine that was. Like God literally just handed it to me in my lap that I now get to have a crusade to go on. And if you know anything about me, I need to have a fight to fight. I need a battle to fight. I need a war to fight. Otherwise, I'm like a, you know, a wartime general just waiting around for things to happen. And I knew instantly, I was like, God is asking me to step up and to speak up and to do something here about this. And I know it was divine too, because my, my gut instinct, my first instinct was that I'm just going to make a crazy ass video calling these people out. And I made a 40 minute video just ranting like I like to do. And the whole thing was muted. <laughs> my voice was muted the whole time. And I've noticed this happened before in the past and I've made mistakes. And I was like, God is is carrying me right now. The grace of God is with me right now. I was like, okay. So I started really taking it seriously. And so I re-uploaded the video where I just, I refuted and I, I explained, you know, how silly it is. But at the same time, I picked up my sword and I say, but I'm going to war. I'm going to war on vice. You vice news, because you're an arm of Satan in this world, corrupting the minds and bodies of our youth. But everything that you stand for, which is vice the opposite of virtue. And so it was so poetic and has given me so, so much steam that I am basically rebranding myself right now as we speak. And so <laughs> for a long time, I was calling myself Uncle Elliot because I'm just kind of like the little bit older uncle who just gives you advice on various things in your life. But I am the general now, General E. Hulse. And I'm building a militia called the King's Militia. And it is modeled after the Misha Militia Immaculate that was pioneered by uh, St. Maximilian Colby. Uh, just so many different beautiful uh, synchronicities or graces are, are, are unfolding. And so it's, it's an apostolate. I call it an apostolate for masculine excellence. And it's about making men strong again but not in the secular way that we're so used to. Oh, personal development, done with personal development. It's a part of the lie. It cannot be separate from the father. We can no longer think of ourselves as individuals. It's not gonna work that way anymore. That's what got us into this mess. We are a body. We are the body of Christ. And so as a body, we work together and each cell, each, each cell system, each organ within, has its own gifts. And so we're bringing, bringing together men of many different gifts in order to facilitate this war on both mortal sin, vice, and uh, the, the, the diabolical arms of Satan through the global corporations and the totalitarian takeover, uh, especially of the media, because that's who you know attacked me first. Why is this so important? Why, not just to you personally, but why is this war, why is now the right time to wage this war? You know how you said earlier that over the last two years, you just oh, had an awakening and you came to Christ? Yes, yeah, something kind of which is something that I have seen happening to many, many people. I've never seen this before in my lifetime but it seems like more and more people in the last two and a half years have been turning to God and specifically to Christianity. So yes, I'm very aware of that. It's happening. It's happening mm. with or without me. You see, I'm just kind of going for the ride. You ask me why it's important, but really it's, it's important for eternity. It's, it's, it's divinely important. It's what God wants. It's what God's doing. I just happen to be an instrument. You happen to be an instrument. We're just kind of, you know, when they say when the, the tide comes in, all boats rise. Well, the, you can't be a boat and not rise when the tide comes in. Tide's coming in. It's like, oh, okay, boat's rising. Now, some people have holes in their boats 
and some people got anchors in their boats and so they're gonna sink <laughs> but if you're a boo a booful boat <laughs> booful boo, is it even a word booful booful a boat if a it's boat not before buoyancy? general boat. eho says it is it's it's gonna belong <laughs> in the dictionary now yeah if you're a, if you're a boat with buoyancy you're gonna float and so we're rising up we're all rising up and so i this is this has been a huge leap of growth or, 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 a, or a quantum leap of growth for me because I'm a prideful guy. I got a big ego mm. and this has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with me. It is 100% the Lord working his war through my hands, through my mouth, through my image. And so if, if Satan want to use my image to, to blaspheme, then it just seems as if God wants to fight back through my face. And so here we are. You said that this is a major growth for you. What are you leaving behind? Is it, is it your ego or what's not coming with you to this next chapter of the war? What, what do you think you need to shed to become well, that instrument? Like yourself, here, here's one, here's one of many, like yourself, I'm a new revert. I was, I was baptized Catholic. I wasn't Catholic for 40 years. I don't, Catholic, I don't know anything about it. The Lord called me back on my 40th. So it's been three years, less than about three years. How does one go from, yo, Elliot, I'm an icon. I'm the one everybody loves and praises to putting the Lord in front, putting God up front, putting Our Lady up front, Catholic even. It's very divisive. It's... Uh, it requires me getting out of the way. It requires me saying that this is not even about me. It's re it requires me uh, not being me and upholding others, letting others shine, letting our Lord shine, letting our, or, or, or creating space for our lady to shine. Maximilian Colby, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Joseph. So all these things, all these things are decreasing me and increasing him. Like, like, uh, like uh, John says, John the Baptist says, I shall decrease right. while he increases. John knew his job. He said, well, I'm just, I'm just paving the way, but I have to decrease so he can increase. Same thing here in my life. I get to decrease. I get to decrease so he can increase. So when you, when you ask me what I get to leave behind, it's my ego, my pride, you know. Does that feel good? In a way, it does. It feels really good because I get to bring a sword with me, right? And that means that there's, there's what's, what does a sword do? It divides. It separates, right? And then Jesus say that? I came, I, I came with a sword, he says. I came with a sword. He didn't have a physical sword, but he came with his divisive mission, his, his divisive uh words uh his his mission that's what i was looking for his divisive mission jesus <laughs> jesus isn't inclusive he says you're either with me or you're not now everybody's invited but you're either with me or you're not and he says it over and over again if right. you don't eat my body and drink my blood as crazy as that sounds I'll unpack that for a moment i am not in you are you eating his body and drinking his blood he gave us his body and blood. He literally says, take this bread and eat it. It is my body. It will be given up for you. If Jesus is who he says he is, then we got to actually start believing his words. We got to live like what he says is true. Drink my blood. It will be spilled out for many and so on and so forth. I'm not, you know, I can't buy, I can't quote that great. Well, so hey, you've only been a Catholic again for three years, so you, you got to have some grace Catholics there. don't know the Bible that well anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that too. We, we Not like the, like the Protestants, because Protestants, that's all they have is the Bible, so they study that sucker hard. So they're smart when it comes to the Bible. But we got a lot of tradition, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and in the faith, we take out pieces of the Bible throughout the year and read it rather than, you know, studying it hard. But that might be something I do one day. Yeah. How, how do you suggest that people join this war the very first thing is you got to understand who the enemy is bro and the enemy is inside you in the form of vice vice that's why it's a war on vice 
You, I'm not asking you to do anything that is that's that's crazy. In fact, most of y'all are already understand. Most of you guys are already on this path. You already know it. I get emails all the time, Elliot. I can't stop masturbating. Elliot, I can't stop watching porn. Elliot, I can't stop smoking weed. Elliot, I'm addicted to social media, dating apps. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm like, well, that's where your war begins. That's where the war begins. We have yeah. to return to a state of grace. And when we, when we return to a state of grace, then and only then can we bear that armor and pick up that sword. Otherwise, we got chinks in our armor and our sword is rusty and weak. So it begins, it begins not with you, you know, the whole idea of work on yourself. It begins with battling the weakness inside of you, the spirit inside you, the demonic spirit inside you. There, there are people that knew exactly what they were doing when they made pornography legal. They knew that they were going to be waking, weakening generations of men. They wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, let's see what happens. Oh, let's give it a chance. Yeah. Oh, it's free love. I believe, I know that they knew that it was a weapon and they unleashed it on us. And so if you're going to go to war and that weapon has been unleashed on your soul, you got to go in there. You got to go in there. You got you to gotta break free from it. All this making marijuana legal. Oh, there's nothing wrong with smoking a little bit of weed. There's nothing wrong with getting high. Snoop Dogg gets high all the time and he's rich. Look at this. Look at Mike Phelps. He smokes weed. And so they, that's another one of the lies that they're trying to unfold for us so that we all become addicted to smoking weed. And so we have you know, no, no motivation. And so we right. have one more vice, one more vice. Oh, you can have as much sex as you want with as many women as you feel like, as long as you wear a plastic bag over your dick and she's taking <laughs> uh, you know, uh, sterilizing pills. Oh, you can just, it, there's nothing wrong with it. And so there goes Which another destroys vice. destroys the very nature of sex itself. And so it's not even, it's so funny, all the things you're listing, it's like, they're not just like introducing something that degrades you. They're also taking something that's beautiful and they're flipping it on its head and making it the exact opposite. Yeah, it destroys virtue. Yeah. One of the things I'm going to get a t-shirt that says this weaponize chastity. I love that. Weaponize chastity. Yeah. <laughs> I love that phrase. Weaponize chastity because fornication is a vice. All this free love, all this free sex is not free at all. You know, the whole uh, documentary that they use with me, that they would try to use my name, they were talking about this kid, Elliot Rogers, who, you know, apparently, yep. and, you know, they, and then they were denigrating this whole idea of men who are incels. I, and my, my position was this. There doesn't need to be any incels. The frustration that men who aren't having sex has was born out of a culture that tells them that they should be fornicating. Otherwise, these men would be content with semen retention. It's a good idea. Brahmacharya, the Hindus call it. Hold your seed, cultivate your strength. Be a man that's generative without spilling your, spilling your seed all over the place. But because MTV or TikTok or the music and all, all the friends and everybody, they're all out there having free love, free sex, fornicating. The young men feel as if, well, why am I not getting that? Why am I not having that fun? Why don't I get that stuff? I am entitled to it. That's and this is why they're behaving the way they're behaving. But what if somebody said, rather than saying you're an incel, which is short for involuntary celibate, celibate, what if there was a sense of dignity and pride associated with being celibate? Paul says it in the Bible. Paul even actually says, St. Paul says, if you can't be like me and you must have sex, marry. Basically, he said, if you can't, if you're so weak that you can't be celibate, then fine. I think, I don't remember, I think it may have been like Ephesians. He says uh, something to the effect of, it's better, it's, it's better, to, better to be like me and not touch a woman. That's what he says. Better not to touch a woman at all. That's what he says. <laughs> but if you must, then marry. So he carried like a sense of dignity that, no, I'm celibate. And right. if you're not, well, you're a little, you're weak, but God has made some concessions for your weakness. Go ahead and marry. Right. Which Here is we have all these men who are, who, are, who are celibate, but they feel bad about it. 
and it doesn't right. need to be that way. Right. Again, another example of them taking something that is actually a virtue, that is actually a strength that allows you to focus on your mission in the world. And instead they're saying that that is the weakness and that the virtue is to be, you know, free sex loving, you know, loser that yeah, addicted. comes in the back. Yeah. <laughs> so they're addicted. They're addicts. Just the right. same way an obese, sloppy, fat mf -er is, you know, eating a box of donuts. And if he if he comes to me and he's eating that fat, that box of donuts with his fat, uh, slimy lips and he looks at and he shows me the donuts and he's like, hey, Elliot, check out all these donuts I'm eating. Mm, I'm eating all the and he's pointing out all the different flavors. I'm like, you're a sick man. You're an addicted man. You have a problem. Why is it not any different when it comes to these men who are addicted to having sex with all these women? You're having sterile transient sex with a bunch of different women that's doing nothing but creating pleasure and chaos in your life. You have a mommy addiction. Beautiful. What a weird place to end the interview. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it actually encapsulates the whole conversation, which is shedding vice and returning to virtue, shedding this idea of constant progression and rather returning to tradition. And I think if I don't want to speak for you, but I think that that's your overall message to people who want to escape the matrix and build that life. What this show is about building a life of purpose, prosperity, and passion. It's about deleting vices from your life and not just leaving a vacuum for more vices to come back in, but filling that space with virtue, with responsibility, mm -hmm. with impact. And like you said before, which I really loved a war to go on. Elliot, right. thank you so much for being with me here tonight. Um, where can everybody find you? Where can they follow this war that you're on and uh, be a part of this mission, this war on vice? Kingsmilitia.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here, brother. You got it, Mark. It's good talking to you, dude. You too. What an incredible conversation, wasn't it? You know, Elliot's one of those guys that tends to be very polarizing. And if you strip away all of your preconceived notions about what he's saying, you too can see for yourself the effect the matrix has on you and begin to learn how to unplug. A couple of action items from today's episode. As always, first, one thing to start. This week, I want you to start a righteous war on evil. Now, this could be something as little as standing up to a bully at work, picking up some trash on your street that's been bothering you for months, or speaking out against an injustice in your community. Whether it's big or it is small, this week, I want you to start a righteous war against vice and for virtue. One thing to stop. Speaking of vices, we all have them. And as discussed, this war against the Matrix starts with you fighting the war against yourself. So this week, I want you to find a vice in your life and stop it. Whether it's smoking weed, drinking alcohol, waking up late, or talking too much trash behind your friend's backs, I want you to pick a vice and utterly destroy it bonus points if you replace it with a virtue. And lastly, one thing to consider. This week, I want you to consider whether or not it's possible that what we see in the world is by design. You know, a lot of people say this is simply progressivism. This is the world moving forward. We have new and better technology, new and better ways of doing things. And while that may be true, are you so sure that we're not going in that same human cycle over and over? And furthermore, is it possible or even likely that there are dark forces, call them what you'd like, that are in control of the destruction and denigration of modern society that we so clearly see today? So this week, I want you to set aside your preconceived notions and consider the source of the matrix. So folks, that is it for episode three of The Real MC. I want to one more time thank our sponsor for this show, Ancestral Fuel and Ancient Strength. You can check out more at fuelyourevolution.com and try the best protein powder on earth, the ultra premium animal-based protein that is designed to not only help you build more muscle, but improve your digestion at the same time 
time. And if you like this show and you haven't already, please like, please comment, please leave a rating on Apple or Spotify podcasts and subscribe to the YouTube channel. It really does help me reach more people with this critical message. Thanks again for tuning in and until next time, cheers.